بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ما بعد. So today, inshallah, we'll be talking about uh, Tahara or the introductory chapters into Tahara. And whenever you open up a discussion of Tahara, of purity, the first discussion in almost all books that deal with Tahara, if not all of them, is water. Um, they also talk about different types of purity. So you have spiritual purity and you have physical purity. There is an over, they, they overlap, right? There, there are some elements that are mutually exclu exclusive and there are some elements that are shared. Like, so for example, if I prayed and there was mud on my clothing, can I pray in mud? Yes. Right, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Right, there's mud on my clothing. I can pray in it. So am I physically pure? No. Well, no, yeah. not. Right, but I, but I am spiritually pure because I, I did wudu. So there, there is some overlap sometimes, uh, you know, in terms of like najasa. So if there's najasa on your clothing, then you are neither spiritually or physically pure. So, you know, there can be overlap and sometimes they are elements that are mutually exclusive. Um, these are the three things that need to be pure in order for you to pray with a difference of opinion on, uh, you know, actually teaching, uh, touching the Quran or touching the Mus'haf itself. But these are the three things when it comes to prayer, right? So your body has to be clean, your garment has to be clean, and your place of prayer has to be clean. Um, without going into too much detail concerning this, clean, what, what does this mean? Does any, anybody want to raise their hand? Do we have a do we have a raising hand thing or no? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Wasn't they free hand. from impurity? Like. Okay. What what is what is impurity? What does that mean? Um, like exam. I mean, like najas, free from najas. Uh, free from najasa, right? So, so not just impurity. We would say a ritual impurity, right? Something that is considered ritually impure. As long as those things are not in any of these three places, then my prayer would be valid. My prayer would be accepted. Inshallah. Uh, types of water. So the in general, most of the madahib say that there are three types of water, right? So you have that which is pure and purifies others, that which is pure in and of itself, and that which is impure. Um, some scholars, they include a fourth category, which is used water. And when they mean and they mention used water, it means that water that is basically recollected after wudu is made. Um, why would that be an issue? What do you guys think? For the, you made wudu and then you recollect and you want to make wudu again? Yeah, so Ayaz raised his hand. Go ahead, Ayaz. Um, it's because the scholar said that when you make wudu, the sins fall off of your body. Uh -huh. and so they consider sins to be naj najasa, like impure. So okay. the question becomes, can you make wudu with, some, with water that has that? Right. So that, that's exactly what it is. Right. There's, it's more of a spiritual element than it is an actual physical element. And, and that's why you have scholars who actually classify like this. You have a difference of opinion on whether you can use that water again. Um, again, I, I don't want to uh, I don't want to get too much into that, uh, but we will touch on it and we will talk about it. So like we said, these are the three general categories of water is tahur, that which is pure in itself uh, and that purifies others. Tahir, which is pure and najis, which is impure. Um, pure water, things like orange juice, tea. Uh, soda, right? All of those things are pure, but you can't use them for wudu. So can you substitute water? Can water be substituted um, to to purify? There are situations of this. Uh, Sheikh Hatim, he doesn't talk about all of those situations, um, but there are situations where you can uh, use dust. The sun in and of itself sometimes can be used to purify. So if something dries out, for example, then that area can become pure. Uh, you have the hadith of Um Salama where she's uh, she had, you know, women had long garments and they used to drag. And she said to the Prophet, Salam, she's like, okay, what if I'm walking and I walk over in Najasa? So the Prophet Salam said, okay, well, the earth right after the Najasa is pure. So that earth will purify in it of itself. Uh, dogs used to enter the Masjid Nabawi because there, it was open, right? They didn't have like doors and gates and things. So they used to enter. Sometimes they would urinate. But if there's no trace left there, you know, it, they would just kind of leave it open to the sun. This is not uncommon with sometimes what we do with like bed sheets. So sometimes if like kids wet the bed or whatever, the, or, you know, they'll, they'll hang the sheets outside in order to purify them. Um, not, not in and of itself, um, but you do have places where, for example, you can't put it outside. So what do you do? You just kind of put it out in the sun. Um, so there, water can be substituted in particular situations. So uh, for spiritual impurity, the ahnaf, they, they say, no, you can't. And what is spiritual impurity? Anything that requires wudu, right? So they're saying that for wudu, there's actually no real substitute. Uh, they allowed nabid, and nabid is basically just the water mixed with dates. 
So what they used to do is they used to store the dates, you know, so just imagine like a container and you would put dates in it and then you would fill it up with water and then you would cover it. So what would happen to that water is like, it would kind of be affected by the dates, but it wouldn't change completely. So they used to allow uh, making it with that, meaning that minor changes don't actually uh, change the ability of the water for, for purity. For physical impurity, yes, you know, obviously you can use, uh, you can use other things to, to clean that. And we gave some examples of that. And another good example would be like, okay, you know, if there is something on the floor, there's urine on the floor and I pour tea over it, you know, can tea be used as a reasonable substitute for that? And, you know, uh, the Ahnaf and Ibn Taymiyyah, they allow that. The other, other Madahib, they say no. Uh, there was a long discussion on the quantity of water, um, there is a lot of difference of opinion on this, but basically if you have a large amount of water and you, basically the difference is that if I have a large amount of water and I mix in a little bit of impurity that doesn't change it, then I can use that water. And a small amount of water, regardless of the amount of impurity that I mix into it, I can't use it. So if I have like a cup of water and I put a drop of urine in it, for like human urine in it, for example, that water cannot be used because it's a small amount. Now, if I did the same thing with like a large body of water, or a large amount of water, then that water is still permissible. And that's basically what the entire argument is. And that's what the entire uh, discussion is. The Malikia, they say that this applies absolutely, as long as the nature of that water doesn't change. And when we talk about the nature of water, we're talking about three things, right? We're talking about the color, we're talking about the odor, and we're talking about the taste by Najasa, right? It's changed by the Najasa. So if there's Najasa mixed into it and the color changes, or if the odor changes, or if the taste changes, then that water cannot be used for um, for purification. It cannot be used for wudu. Um, so the quality of water, it's this it, this can affect it. So basically, if it's artificially mixed with the purity, it can be used, right? It can be used, or it can't be used depending on on the method. And I'm sorry, let me take a have in my notes here. So if it's naturally mixed with the purity, so for example, if there's like mud or if there's um, uh, like dirt or if there are leaves, if there are other things, all the madahib say that's okay, right? There, there's nothing wrong with that. I, I'm sorry, go, go ahead, Ayaz, you have a question? By artificial, do you mean here that um, the item doesn't like necessarily dissolve in the water per se? No, no, I mean things like you wouldn't find them in nature, like mixing sugar in with water or um, like orange juice or tea, right? Those aren't things you find you you find in nature versus mu versus muddy water, right? That's something that you find in nature uh, versus uh, salt water. That's something you find in nature or versus, uh, you know, mixing in twigs and mixing in leaves and these type of things. This is, this is what I'm talking about, uh, about natural purities because mud is pure, leaves are pure, twigs are pure, salt is pure, right? And all of those things we find, you know, sand is pure. All of those things we find, uh, in, we find in nature. Does that, does that help? Yeah, just okay. Okay, I mean, yeah. Um, so you do have a difference of opinion amongst the scholars on if it's mixed in, can you continue using the water, right? Can you continue using the water? And I guess a good question would be here is like, how much sugar can I put in water before I'm not allowed to use it to make wudu? Or how much salt can I put in water before I'm not allowed to make it, use it to make wudu or mud or, you know, orange? Like, you know, for example, I, I keep squeezing orange juice into the water. At what point can I not use that water to make wudu anymore? So you again, you have a difference of opinion. The, the Ahnaf and the Hanabada, they say that, okay, you can you can continue using it. And the Malikiya, the Shafi'iya, and some of the Hanbalis, they say, no, you can't. So my question here would be, okay, what's the delineator? What At what point can I not use that water anymore for wudu? Unless one of those three qualities are changed. Um. So that only applies to impurities. If I even if I put one spoon of sugar into water, it's going to change the flavor, right? Um, I also heard um, until you distinguish, meaning it's still water, or is it now a different product? Meaning. Okay, good. I, I that's one indicator, right? That's a very strong indicator that I no longer call it water. So, you know, if I keep mixing, if I keep squeezing oranges into the water, there's going to become a point where I call it orange juice, right? At that point, once I call it orange juice, I can't use it anymore. They, but how do we do, how do we deal with things like that completely dissolve, like sugar or salt? The taste is going to change immediately. So, so it can't, it can't be just that. Well, that still looks like water. <laughs> right? It's good. Regardless of how much you put in, it's going to still look like water, right? Yeah. 
would would it be at a point where you can distinguish the, a difference between how water tastes and the input of the sugar if, in the case of sugar? Okay, so I, like I said, even with one spoon, you can tell the difference in the water, right? Okay, I see. So, so and and the thing is, the process um, what, why is this argument even there? Because the process um, allowed us to use the seawater, and seawater clearly has a salty taste. Clearly, right? There's there's no doubt to that. It's like it's, it's in its natural state, yeah. So that's one argument. Say, okay, well, that's in its natural state. But my question would be like, all right, what allows you to say, okay, no, in an unnatural state, that doesn't apply. Anyone? All right, we'll continue then. <laughs> no, no, I can't. Well, and Allah knows best. Uh, Allah knows best. I would imagine that it becomes to, it comes to the point where it actually starts crystallizing, and you you just it does, it's not it it really isn't water anymore. There's just so much sugar in it that the consistency is going to change. You can't even you can't even use it as water anymore. And the same thing would apply to salt. Like you'd have to put so much salt in it that the salt isn't dissolving anymore, and it just overtakes the water. So it, it would just be wet salt or wet sugar. Mm. At that point, you, you wouldn't be able to do it because even somebody who looked at it, they'd be like, okay, no, that, that's sugar. But even with the sugar situation, you know, when we, uh, when we go buy coffee, you, you ask them for what? You ask them for a liquid, liquid cane sugar, right? Mm. And, and everybody agrees that you can't do that. But what happened there? The consistency changed. And, and Wallahu Adam, it, it would seem that not only the, the taste would have to change, but also the consistency would have to change where it's now a syrup. Right. And, and because it's a syrup now, I cannot use it anymore for um, for uh, for wudu because it wouldn't be considered water. And like I said, Allah knows best. That's only at the bougie coffee shops that Muhammad goes to. Allahu Akbar. Uh, all, 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 all of us, all of us mix our own water, sugar. Uh, OK, mashallah. Uh, uh, mashallah. As long as you're not making it, using it for wudu, man. <laughs> so uh, use water like you guys had defined very well. It's the water that's recollected after wudu. Um, so you have some of the Ahnaf and some of the Hanabila who feel that uh, it cannot be used. The majority feel that it is pure um, and it's not an issue and you continue using it, inshallah. So what about when you have situations where there is doubt? Um, and over here, you, these are two maxims or these are what are called al-qawaid al uh, or two fiqh maxims. Basically, that certainty will always take precedence and certainty can be in either impurity or in the case of purity. So for example, if you're sure that impurity dropped into that cup of water, then at that point, if you're on that opinion, it is for sure impure. And if you're unsure of its impurity, then it is going to be pure. Um, and, and that qaida is called al yaqeen la yuzul bishak, that certainty is not removed by doubt. Um, another maxim that Sheikh Hatim mentions and he talks about is that Mala yitimul wajib illa bi fahuwa wajib. That which leads to an obligation is also an obligation. So if prayer is an obligation, then that also means what? Wudu. Wudu is an obligation. Right? So that's that's where you know uh, these two maxims or these two qawaid actually come into play. Um, so there's something else I should have to talk about. And I don't mean to be throwing a lot of stuff into the mix, but um, concerning blood. So he says here, small amounts of impurities can be ignored. Uh, this is a Hanafi opinion. Um, and, and this is very applicable to a number of different situations. You know, um, you have the Prophet Sallallahu actually telling us to ignore small amounts of urine, you know, whether, you know, whether there be a splashback um, from when you use the bathroom or whether a, you know, a, a boy or girl pees on you. And we'll talk about the differences and how to deal with that urine. Uh, so how all of those things, they, they will have a difference in how you deal with those impurities. The Ahnaf, they say that small, upon, uh, small amounts can be ignored. I, th I think that it about, uh, that talk about Najasat, that talk about impurities. So how do we remove impurities? Is, was this the end of the chapter? Was this the end of the video or no? It's uh, video number six, remo removing impurities. Okay, so th this this wasn't, isn't in, uh, this isn't the fourth class, right? No. No. Okay, so, so we'll, we'll stop there. Um, and I think it's very important. Why is this chapter so important? Why even talk about this? Are we talking about water or are we talking about generally in about purification in general? Uh, either or, either or, whichever, whichever question you want to answer. Uh, 
Well, it's a, one of the conditions before the prayer. Mm -hmm. uh, Absolutely. Right. So, I mean, it's a condition for the prayer. Uh, and, and that is the most important thing. When you talk about what are the fundamentals of Islam, what is something that, you know, we, we cannot uh, ignore at all? What are the things that we have to spend our time and we have to focus on? It is these five pillars, right? It is these five pillars is believing in Allah, believing in his messenger. And the first one praying, right? And if I cannot pray except without wudu, I cannot pray except without wudu. That comes in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that the prayer is not accepted except without tahara or except without wudu. So that is something that is really fundamental. Taib, the second discussion, why I spend so much time on defining water? Because if we have to purify ourselves, we need to know how to do that and with, with the what. Okay, with what, right? So the how part we're, we're going to get to, inshallah, when we talk about wudu. But with what? Like, how do I actually purify myself? You know, there's there's so many different types of liquid that we come in, uh, we come in contact with, you know, there are different types of teas that we drink, soda and water that we only use water, right? We only use water. And why is that? Why do you guys think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specified wudu to water? Like, why not just, why not apply it to all, all our different, different types of liquids? Hmm. Oh, yes, go ahead. I mean, I think, it's from the blessing of Allah that water is abundant for us. And so it's something that for the most part, people have access to. Unfortunately, some people don't at this time, but mm -hmm. I mean, I think like if Allah had specified that you have to find orange juice to make wudu, I mean, it would be very difficult for a lot of people to get orange juice. Well, I and think it's from a blessing from Allah that it, water was used and water comes from the sky, and, you know, mm -hmm. something that Allah it, provides for us. Yeah. No, absolutely. And I agree with you 100% because of its abundance and because of its availability. I mean, it's it's just uh, amazing on, you know, uh, like you said, for, for most of mankind, the availability and the access that they have to water and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually uses that in the in the properties of water in and of itself, right? You know, not, not only is it is it cleansing, but it's also cooling, right? There are a number of properties that that do apply to water that uh, that don't apply to other liquids. Like, well, what about the other types of water that we have? Like, for example, Zemzem. Can can I use Zamzam for purification? Uh, yeah, can definitely. We, should, should we, we we got a poll here? You know, I need to start using these other features. Man. Definitely. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll figure out how to use all these things, inshallah. But in general, can we use Zamzam? Can we use Zamzam or not? Yes. Yes. Yes, we can. Uh, yes, we can. Absolutely. Is there um, is there more reward in using Zemzem? No, no, right. But but th there would be a blessing. There would be a blessing. There's no doubt about it. Why? Because Zemzem water is is blessed, right? There's a very specific blessing that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has given to Zemzem that He has not given to other types of water. Uh, what about bathing in Zemzem or using Zemzem to to clean yourself for istinjat, for example, for wiping yourself? Is that okay? Or is that disrespectful to the holy water? Well, it's not holy. It's blessed water. It's a, there is a difference, no? Ah, what's the difference? Meaning holy, it's intrinsically sacred, but uh, but blessed is not sacred. It's not sacred. So it brings. <laughs> I don't. I, I know. I can. I, I can explain, but it's uh -huh. not like that. Not inherently. Yes. Yeah. So someone can be blessed. Okay. Someone can be blessed, but it does not make him sacred and saint and uh, the uh, rest. Okay. And the same with the Zamzam. -zam. Fair enough. Uh, okay, Nazan. Okay. All right. What, what are you saying? Lauren, Lauren wanted to say something? It looked like she was about to say something. Go ahead, Lauren. I'm just talking out loud to myself at the screen. I don't have any. Oh, okay. I was going to say that people, I was just, no, I'm not going to say it. I'm good. No, no, Bismillah. It's okay. Bismillah. This is a space. Vegas rules. We're just recording, but we, we can cut this out. We can just be ratchet. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you, you can you can you can you can you can use them some however you like, Lauren. All right, it's 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 completely permissible. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. Uh, you you have you have the green light from me. So, 
Um, it, well, there are different types of water. There's no doubt about that. And, and I think it's very important to understand that because we have to use this for our spiritual purity. And, and we need to understand that wudu is, is a very spiritual action, right? Be, because we're not, wudu isn't the entire body. And there are only certain parts of the body that we actually wipe the water over and we use it over. So there is a major spiritual aspect to it. Like there is a physical cleansing aspect to it, but the reality is it's it's more spiritual than than physical. A person can still be dirty after wudu, right? He can still be dirty or she still can be dirty after wudu. But uh, the, the spiritual aspect of it and the emotions and the ritual aspect of it is something that's really important and something that, that we shouldn't, you know, we definitely shouldn't ignore. Are there any questions on the doubts? Or any types of water i mean I, th I think we can honestly do more videos than just one but uh, it's it's totally up to you guys what if you jump in a pool a pool uh, yeah. water, pool oh, water. so we'll, we'll talk about we'll talk about ghusl and we'll talk about uh you know how to actually make wudu but that's a very good question what about chlorinated water can i use it for wudu or not what do you guys think i would say yes well Mm -hmm. perhaps it would go back to like taste and smell again like because there's chlorine in tap water and you can make wudu with tap water okay so can i make it with pool water i don't know you I don't know so. i think so maybe okay. it smells and tastes different though so that's a thing so if you're depending on what how you're holding your water to but, but remember smelling and tasting it only applies to what impurities to impurities right it doesn't apply it doesn't it doesn't apply to things that are that are pure so is chlorine pure or not I, yeah. yeah, it's, yeah. Right. So, so there, not to, you wouldn't want to chug it, but no, like, no, I'm saying like they're, they're not to confuse poisonous <laughs> with purity, right? Those are, those are two different things. Something can be poisonous, but still be pure. Yeah. Right. Something, like right. So, no, no. So, so there are a number of things that, you know, are, can be dangerous to consume, but it doesn't mean that that thing is impure. Like, for example, it's probably not a good idea to eat wood, but wood is pure. Right there, there's nothing wrong. Uh, there's nothing inherently impure about about wood, but you don't you don't want to uh, you don't want to consume it. Well, pool water. Sure. Oh. Depends Depends how big that pool is. Do, do we assume? Do we assume the natural state of things are pure? Like in this case, we would just assume chlorine is pure until there's something that says it's not pure. Yeah. So so the najasat. It, so here, uh, that's a very good point. Mashallah. Like right. So you have things that are haram, and you have things that are najas. And the shared characteristic between uh, characteristic between both of these things is their ma'duda, that they are actually limited. The only things that have come in the Quran and the Sunnah as described as specifically najis, as specifically ritually impure, those are the only things that we can actually say are impure. And the same things with the things that are haram. Only the things that are clearly haram can actually have that label and contain that label. Anything not within those spheres, right? So anything not within the sphere of najis would be considered pure. And anything not within the sphere of haram would be considered mubah, would be considered permissible. So um, I've heard this, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but they say that, that alcohol in a, in a state that it is not najis, but it's haram. There's a... There's a major ikhtilaf. There's a lot of difference of opinion that we will talk about, inshallah. You know, be, because, and a lot of it has to do with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's description of it, calling it rijs. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that, inshallah. We'll, we'll definitely get to that. We'll talk, when we talk about najasat, the things that are najis, uh, because there are a number of things that there is a huge difference of opinion over. Um, alcohol being one, um, different animals, right? And the, and the sweat from those animals, uh, whether what is connected to those animals and what things are not connected, like the hair, for example, of a pig, you know what I mean? So there, there are a number of things that, that we definitely will talk about, inshallah, and how do you actually identify things that are najis that are ritually impure? I, I think somebody else had a question. No? I'm gonna say, what about making, uh, using water, that, river water, or like water that sewage is dumped into? Is that like a kulutane thing, like quantity? So that's, okay. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a large amount of water, right? So that's a large amount of water. Now, can we use it? Like, I mean, making wudu in the Potomac, it might not be a good idea. <laughs> but, but saying that, that, that would be for other reasons, right? That'd be for health reasons that you don't want to do it. But for like practical reasons, is it okay for me to make wudu from like from the, from the Potomac River? Yes, yes or no? Why or why not? Yes. If yes. you had a concern about your health, then perhaps maybe no, because, uh -huh. you know, preservation of life. So if you were worried this water might kill me, 
okay, but that that's a secondary reason for it for it not being like so. And at that point, you would say no, it's haram for you to use because it could cause harm to your life. Mm-hmm. But I'm asking as a, a from a purity standpoint, mm-hmm. from a purity standpoint, is that water is that water ritually pure? Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah, I I would agree with you. I would say that the water is ritually pure, until what point? No longer water. Not just, that. That's in a purity sense, right? Like, what about when in an impure sense? At what point would I decide, like, hey, you know what? I can't use this water to make wudu. Until it's mixed with something else, whether, oh, it, be, whether it be pure or impure. Oh, so I mean, it's it's a river, right? So you have a number of pure things that are mixed into it. You have mud, you have dirt, you have sand, you have leaves, you have trees, right? You have uh, different things growing in the water. So my question would be like, okay, at what point can I not use that water? I think if it, go ahead. Taste, smell, color. Ah, good. Taste, smell, or color in what way of what? Of something impure. Of something impure, ahsent. You know, that, that, that is the condition, right? The, it has to be the impurity that changes one of these three characteristics. Um, ev- even for those things, there is there's a small amount of tolerance that, again, we'll, we'll talk about in the future. But in general, if these three characteristics, if you find one of these three, then that water cannot be used. So are you saying that even in the situation where it's more than chukulatin or if it's like a flowing river per se? Yeah. Okay. No, so like in a flowing river sense, like, you know, I mean, like at that point, you would, um, it, it'd have to be overwhelming. Yeah. Right. It, it'd have to be overwhelming for you not to be able to, um, to use that versus like, you know, there's a swimming pool, like, uh, I don't know, a swimming pool is a bad example, but an aquarium, right? An aquarium is like, you know, a medium amount size of water. It's not really like a lot, a lot of water. But if you have a small aquarium and somebody puts like three drops of Najasa into it, at that point, you would have a number of scholars say, no, this water can't be used uh, because it's smaller than a qullatain. Uh, there are a number of issues with the whole qullatain thing. Um, it's, it only comes in like one hadith. Um, it's, it's a volume that's not really well-defined um, historically. So how to actually figure out what a qullatain is? You know, again, there are a number of issues that are with it. You have some scholars who said, okay, no, qullatain is actually defined by this. Uh, and there is, a, there is a bit of a tradition connected to it. But uh, in, in general, if you say that amount of water, you're going to have a difference of opinion. Um, I, you know, I mean, so it, it is what it is. Any other questions? No? All right. Or while you guys are reading, if you guys have any questions or while you guys are listening to the lectures, if you have any questions, go ahead and, and you know, share them. Uh, and then we can talk about them, inshallah, at the, at the end of class. Uh, I guess I can uh, I can open up the floor now because we have time of not necessarily related questions. <laughs> Just... uh, I guess before we uh-huh. end on that topic, I guess sure. to, to summarize then what we would say is that um, for generally water can be used for Water can only be well. Water at the Yamam can be used for ritual impurity, and water generally is the best, is can be used for um, physical impurity. But um, I guess some other things could be used for that too. Which I guess like physical impurity, like for example, soap, right? You know what I mean? Or yeah. you have uh, people who, like you know when before they go into for surgery, they wash their hands with iodine. You know what yeah. I mean? So like you have a number of different things that can be used for physical impurity. Um, the spiritual impurity is is very limited, right? It's very limited in the sense that it can it it's only water or some type of water mixed in with an, another substrate. Mm-hmm. So you know you'll have situations where you can use mud, um, for example, or camphor. Uh, both of these things were very specifically and categorically used during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu mixed in with the water and used for purification, whether of the dead or whether of utensils or whether of other things. Um, so and. and the, when we get to the discussion on, okay, why is it that the Prophet ﷺ talked about using dirt to actually clean vessels and clean utensils? Why is that? I mean, we have to realize that they didn't have soap, right? So soap is not something that was readily available, you know, during the time of the companions. So what was their soap? Their soap was sand, right? Their soap was sand, their soap was dirt, because that's, what is the purpose of the soap, right? The purpose of the soap is to remove the smell, right? It's to remove the smell and to remove the the major impurities that, that are on our hands. So that is the purpose of the dirt. That is the purpose of the sand. You know, if you, I don't know if you guys have ever been to the beach or, you know, if you've ever been camping or whatever, that, that is actually one way to do it. It'll, it'll remove the smell 
and you wash it the first time you know i mean like it's not washing per se but it's like you know using using that dirt to kind of clean your hands off and then using water afterward because you don't because soap is it wasn't a thing for them soap is a, is a modern thing and this is why you have more when soap was invented you have many many of the hambadis saying that oh it's completely fine to use soap also why because soap is actually a substitute for the for the dirt or for the mud if that i hope that I hope that makes sense and then to continue with that, then the, mm -hmm. in terms of water, when it becomes impure, if it's a small amount, if even a little bit of impurity goes into it, a najas, something that's not just goes into it, mm -hmm. then it becomes impure. But for larger amounts, if the color, taste or smell changes, then it becomes impure. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and that's, that's something you won't have. Uh, I mean, you, you'll, you'll just have the Malikia disagreeing with you, but in general, everybody else will say it will agree with everything that you said. Yeah. Sheikh, uh, I don't know if we're going to cover this in future, but it's totally out of topic. Mm. Um, so for the Wulugul Kalb too, do, I, do we substitute the, 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 the soap for the dirt, like just you mentioned? Uh, the the Hamadis would say, yeah, no problem. And, and we will talk about okay. it. Okay. Nice, nice. Alhamdulillah, man. Shafi is uh, strict on that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it all comes down to, do you, do you consider something ritual or something ta'abudi? Or do you consider it to be ma'lul, right? So is there is there a illa for it? Is there a reason that the Prophet wanted us to wash it with dirt? Um, and if if he did, was there a practical reason or was there a religious reason? And th that's all it boils down to. Any other related questions? If not, we will end inshallah and continue next week. Controversial question. Tahir or mutahir? Yani weed. Yes. Is it tahir? Um, uh, weed, with cannabis? No. Yeah. yeah. Is it? Why? Why would it be impure? Because that album was whack. <laughs> Agreed. But say, saying that you you there's the najasat like we said are limited, and just because yeah. something is haram by qiyas, something is haram by analogy, it doesn't mean that it's also najis by analogy. Anamankinam. <laughs> Okay. No. Just to be clear, you're saying that weed is haram. <laughs> like this is. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. Just to be clear. No. <laughs> but perhaps the what is it? The oil that. Buy now. So, so, oil, so the thing. The thing uh, it's, I mean, I guess I, I opened up the floor, right? So basically, um, you have you have THC and you have CBD, right? Both of these things can be extracted from from the hemp. It can be extracted from the cannabis. I have a problem with THC. I don't have a problem with CBD. Why? Because CBD doesn't have the intoxicating properties that the, that the THC does. So, you know, can you, you, like, can I wear like, for example, like, a, uh, what, you know, those hemp woven shirts and all of those other things? Absolutely. And some people are like, oh, how are you going to say that? Well, if I can drink grape juice, right? So you, you will have permissible uses for plants and you will have impermissible uses for plants. Uh, the permissible uses, like, you know, if you have, uh, you know, like I said, you know, you have hemp shirts, um, a lot of people use it for, you know, weaving and all those other things. Uh, CBD oil, it has it has different properties for different people in their joints and whatnot. I, again, I don't have an issue with that. The problem I do have is, is with THC, you know, what is extracted from it. The same, like I said, with grapes, you have permissible uses and you have impermissible uses. And the same thing would apply to, uh, to hemp, uh, to cannabis, and Allah knows best. So I, I, hope, I hope that clarifies a little bit, Ayaz. Does I just didn't want anyone to walk away from this? <laughs> oh, she said it was pure, so let's go for it. There, yeah, go for it, right? Allah must done. Is that, but I'm saying even you have a number of uh, scholars who also say alcohol is pure, right? But that doesn't that doesn't take away from the fact that it is um, that it is impermissible to consume. I have a question, Sheikh. This is something again totally off. But in the video, uh, mm -hmm. Sheikh Hatim, when he was speaking about. Uh, I don't remember, but he was talking about uh, uh, the mafhum al mukhalafa that the ahnaf don't accept it. But uh, so for that specific hadith, if they accept it, so do they take the mafhum of the hadith, but mm -hmm. not the mafhum in terms of you know mantuq and mafhum, rather yeah. than mafhum al mukhalafa? Okay, so basically what Uthman is talking about, he's saying that okay, if can can you can you accept the contradictory understanding of a hadith? So if there's a hadith and there's an understanding that you take away from it, can you say the opposite? You know, does doesn't apply. A, a lot of that has to do with their with their dealing with qiyas and how to deal with a hadith that they found problematic. 
So in in the situation of mafhum mukhalifa, wallahi, I think they accept it. Yeah, Uthman. I don't I don't think they reject it. Um, I just mm. think I think I think there are so the the examples that many many people use when they're talking about the Hanafi is is the is is when you basically you take an animal and like a goat or a, any milking animal and you don't milk it for a few days. So what happens is when you don't milk it, this is, this is called a bayas sara. Like you know when you when you actually you you hold the udders of the animals for a few days. So wh- when you go to sell it, it makes it look like okay, this animal is a, it, it produces a lot of milk. So what happens is a person goes and buys that animal thinking that it's it produces a lot of milk, and after a few days, he or she finds out like okay, this is you know it's not producing a lot of milk. So what happened is that the Prophet sallallahu as comes in a hadith, it says that okay, you have to return that you return the animal. The guy needs to give you money, but you have to give him a sa'a or you have to give him, it's, it's a volume, right? Four handfuls of dates along with the animal. So you can return the animal, but you have to give these dates. And many of the scholars say the reason for that is because you use the milk, right? Normally, we would think that, okay, since you use that, however much milk you use, that's how much milk you would return. But this comes in a very specific hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. So you have a majority of scholars who say, that okay, you have to follow the mantuq, right? You have to under, you have to follow the the stated text of the hadith and follow it in that way. The Hanafis they say no. They say okay, this actually, this hadith there has to be some issue with it because it goes against uh, common sense, right? It goes against common sense and it goes against analogy that that would be a, that would apply in this situation. So because it goes against that analogy, they would not take they would not take the uh, they would not take the mantuq of the hadith. In this, in, in this particular situation But um, in, in terms of Taking the, the opposite understanding of a hadith I, I don't think that's an issue Wallahu alam. I don't think that's a problem They, they just place qiyas pretty high up um, on, their, on, on their legal tools When it came to actual rulings But wallahu alam. I, I, I don't know for, for sure I thought so but when, when Sheikh Hatim brought it up And he said that I was like You know that, that gave me some questions Yeah yeah, yeah. So, Allah uh, it, it is something that I'd, I'd I'd have to look a little bit more into. Let me um, let let me get a hold of uh, a few of my uh, my Darulum friends, and I'll I'll I'll, I'll ask them. As well. <laughs> Inshallah. Sheikh, speaking of impurity on uh, during the uh, uh, speaking of impurity on the prayer place, uh, just an example. If if there is an impurity on the on on on, on the place you want to pray. And you put your prayer rock on it and stand on the prayer rock. Is this permissible? As long as it doesn't soak through. Uh-huh. Okay. Right? But, uh, okay. Yeah. But if it's like a dry impurity and you're putting it on top of it, well, I don't I I mean I would personally find another place. Yeah. No, of course. Yeah. But I always wonder when yeah. say clean pr- pr- prayer place, does yeah. it mean so, yeah, so I, I guess a better example would be like, okay, there's somebody somebody walked by with their dog and their dog pooped there and they buried it, right? And you parent you're praying over that place, mm, okay. right? So I think I think that would be that would be very similar to what you're saying. Mm. It would be permissible because the, the the surface has to be pure. The surface has to be pure. As for what's underneath, well, you you have no control over that. Okay. And so. So if, since you can do that, I mean, as long, I mean, even if you are surrounded by all impurities, but just your circle, your yeah, yeah, you're 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 good. Okay, yeah. because I, I, I see, yeah, I, I'm asking you because my friends are like uh, they have uh, this, um, they are obsessed with uh, impurity, and I'm telling them you don't have to go that much. Most beyond. most most people who are obsessed about those things, they, it's usually some kind of waswasa. They have the waswasa issue. Yeah, I, this is what I tell them. Saying, yeah. so I just wanted to double check. It, it, it's really not that difficult, right? <laughs> you know, you be, how do you determine your place of prayer and your garment and everything is clean? You just look and you smell, right? You you can see it. I'm, I'm not going to say taste, right? <laughs> but <laughs> but you, you just need to look and smell. That's it. That's all you have to do. You know, just look at your clothing. Everything looks clean, and not just that. For example, if you prayed. After your prayer, that you see something, you see in the jasa, your prayer is valid. You're, you're completely fine because at that point you would assume that 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 impurity came the moment you saw it, because you cannot verify that it came before that point. And your prayer is still valid. Like it, there's no, you, you know, getting involved into all of these, you know, mental acrobatics like oh, you know, this is nudges and that's nudges and like yeah, I have to stay away from it. All of these things is it's really, you know, it's it really can lead to a mental illness. It really can. So just one more example, similar example. So um, 
we were praying with my friend and my and we were like at the, at the corner like in, in at the corner of the wall and it, it, it was let's say a good spot for someone to relieve himself there but there was nothing there, yeah. there there was no smell but he was upset with that saying and i told him told him dude we don't see anything we don't smell anything we we should not be making up stuff what we don't really see in exactly. smell. No, no. And that's what it boils down to. As long as you don't see anything, as long as you don't smell anything, you would assume that that place is pure. Yeah. Right. You, uh, otherwise, if if you just start assuming everything is impure, you're just not going to pray because mm -hmm. there there's going to be a chance that anywhere you go, it's like, okay, man, what are you talking about? This is, there's, there's not even a bathroom here. Okay. It's possible that somebody used the bathroom and they walked over here and there's an adjust on their shoes. Right. You, you know, you, it just never ends. Right. There's, it's just never ending. Wes -wesa. It's never ending whispers that you're constantly going to hear. And, and these are just all, you know, uh, satanic methods that he uses in order to distract us and prevent us from praying. Mm -hmm. Plus, I guess uh, if we don't have any other questions, uh, we'll end here. And inshallah, like I said, I'm I'm going to try to keep up with these weekly quizzes. Um, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy. It, it is. It's, it, it is kind of, it's kind of working. Alhamdulillah. Zakallah khair. Lay wallahu alam wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nabiya Muhammad wa alayhi wa sallam. Subhanakallah. Alhamdulillah. Wa shallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa alayhi wa sallam. Wa alayhi wa sallam. Wa alayhi wa sallam.